Yeah, so um, I wrote the book, The Anarchist Guide to Historic House Museums with Deborah Ryan, who is my dear friend, and she was the professor of architecture the first year that I was undergrad at UNCC, and I, um, it was her first year of teaching, so we both globbed onto each other, and here we are many years later, ancient, um, and we just wrote that book. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is to give you um, a kind of um, round, round view of where historic house museums fit into the larger cultural scenario. So it's really two parts. The first part is to give you some of the background of the Anarchist Guide, how we got started, and what were the kind of um, research tools that we used to get to the information that the book talks about. The second part of the talk today, I want to quickly go through, I've, we've been very lucky, Twisted Preservation, to be able to um, travel internationally and um, really consult and speak and see how museums and heritage sites and cultural institutions are dealing with societal change. And so the second part are ideas that I believe are kind of happening now outside of professional best practice, and it's really my thought that we need to pay attention to these things because they're coming. So with that, we will get started. The first thing I want to do is please understand, um, I have been called a menace, an idiot. Um, I was called the seven-headed dragon of the apocalypse to history. So that's, that's why this is up here. On the flip side, the book is in its seventh printing since December of 2015, which is really surprising to me because I only thought my mom would buy this book. Um, and in, in a state of um, total um, uh, un not understanding what's going on. This is a portrait from one of my daughters of me standing there just saying, I don't know why this book is in its seventh printing. I don't quite understand it. And then as part of Twisted Preservation, um, we have a blog um, and a website, and we also do one night stands, which is when we sleep in historic house museums, use the collections, sorry all you collections managers, um, and actually do the stuff that normal people do, and then we blog about it. And this map over here, although it's light, shows you that we're really lucky because we're, I think, over 85 different countries are reading Twisted Preservation blog right now. Um, we just finished doing the um, Governor's Mansion in North Carolina. Carolina, and before that we were in the attic of Q Palace on the wood floors. That was fun. <laughs> what really got me started with Anarchist Guide um, is our little house in uh, Philadelphia. Um, and in August of 2009, here it is. Cute little house, took nine years to restore. We loved it. Full of kind of second-rate arts and crafts stuff. Um, but, you know, it worked for us. Uh, I moved to New York City, um, and in less than a month, the people who purchased our house destroyed it. And so what happened was, um, on Facebook, our neighbors put this up to show me what our house had become. And there was such this kind of deep, you can, you can imagine, deep um, um, missing of this house, which we had sold, right? We... It's not our house any longer. <clears throat> but at the same time, I was also running 23 historic house museums in New York City. So the very thing that I was spending time on, and then my house gets destroyed, what's interesting is I didn't have the same intimate connection to the 23 sites that I was managing as compared to my house itself. And this was really the beginning of, hey, something's up here because I think I'm doing everything right with house museums, and I don't think I am. Because at that time, you know, this was a, a study that we did on two house museums in Philadelphia that I was running, um, and for a year-long study, we, we um, tracked all of the pedestrians on the sidewalks, all of the um, carriage riders in front of these houses, and you can see the percentages that actually entered. Very, very low. And then it gets even more low when I tell you that includes weddings and special events. Now this is in the dead smack center of the most visited spot in all of Philadelphia. So if these houses are not getting visitors, there's something up that is much larger than, you know, whether or not you're, you're being friendly.
One of the first things that we did is we started to research house museums. And each one of these are, we did a series of one minute videos of habitation, of curatorial, of house museum experiences. And what this did was this started to share with us what were the problems that no one was really talking about. You see, the issue here is that, just as was noted, not many people have done research about house museums. It's just not something that people really cared that much about. They thought the business model was pretty well set. Um, and so these kind of quasi-scientific um, ideas started to come out by us saying, well, no one's done this research, let's do it ourselves. Let's actually take cameras into house museums. Let's actually study collections from people's lives. How do people view these things? How do they use these things? What's it like for community around a house museum? Well, it's no surprise. What we learned was that the community outside of a house museum had very little to do with the house museum itself. And the narrative inside the house museum very, very rarely spoke to the larger community. This may seem stupid to us now, but at the time, no one had really done research. No one had really solidified that this was a disconnect between cultural institutions. And in fact, these are the original notes that I was writing about why history sites suck um, and I'm just writing it as my daughter is driving down the road because we were shamed at a house museum and it was so boring. And here I was running New York City's house museums. So if it was boring me and it was a problem for me, there's a much larger problem. So we started to do what I call anarchist workshops which again, I apologize in advance, we took all the ropes down, <clears throat> all the plexiglass in front of the doors, um, we let everybody sit on everything. You could do anything to the space. Um, and we had anarchist tags that you could drop. And this is just to tell you that we, we wanted to reconfigure what habitation was like in the house museums themselves. And through these workshops, we started to gain research tools. Um, these things are anarchist tags, which are something that we started with the uh, Anarchist Guide book. Um, this is showing you a floor plan of one of the house museums with the tags and what was written. And we did very specific kind of um, targeted research about what people expected, what people wanted, where in the house they wanted this. And then what was the relationship of that experience to their larger lives? And we'll talk a bit more about that. Also what we did is we formulated this crazy chart and we wanted to know excitement, imagination, and energy. Here, we're going to give you a chart, go through this tour, walk through it, keep track of your time, tell me when things are happening for you and when things are not happening for you. Well, what did we find out? We found out that almost everything we spend our time on got very low marks interpreted, fully restored, text boxes, guided tours. When did they get high marks? When they were left alone. When they left the house, which was one that was a little hurtful. <laughs> Somebody, you know, they're like, oh, I love this unrestored outbuilding, you know? And so what this started to tell us was we were spending our time on things we thought because of museum best practice were the right things to do, but in fact, it wasn't at all what our visitors wanted. And so we also started to track what most house museum tours were like. We call it the hallway tour. <laughs> and then we would do the same house and we would track how people would go through a house on their own in one of our workshops. You can imagine everything that we found out then we also studied distinct activities because it occurred to us that perhaps one of the reasons why house museums are not really that enthralling is because none of us believe that we could actually live there and many of us don't believe that people actually live there. So we started to track your real life habitation. In this case, it was two hours from when you woke up in bed to when you left the house. And so what we started to do was track what we call distinct activities. Most house museums have one distinct activity. I stand and I listen. That's it. That's it. But most of us have, have tons of distinct activities just in two hours' time. 
So what we're starting to do is to think that we need to reconsider what the tour is like from the very beginning. That come about it from distinct activities, not about your narrative. Come about it from the kind of physicality and behavioral interaction. So this is, this is where our research starts to take us. And here is the Van Cortlandt Manor in New York, and it pretty much shows you the amount of the house that you could see. They had iron bars this tall. No joke. <coughs> Open House is a Have unique here? event space. It is a collaboration with the people of York, Alabama to transform a blighted property in York downtown into a new public art project that has the shape of a house but can physically transform into a 100-seat open-air theater free for the public. So isn't that wild, right? So, so this, this is York, Alabama. So this was a collaboration between an artist and a community. And so instead of turning this historic building into a historic house museum, what they really wanted was a community space. So they deconstructed it and reconstructed it into a 100-seat theater open to the public. And so what I'm showing you here are things that are happening all along the fringes of house museums. And I start at the top with this guy in San Francisco who's like, why the hell does George Washington get a house museum and I don't? So he just, he just turned his house, muse house into a museum. <clears throat> you can go there and watch Netflix with him. <laughs> and also, there is this really incredibly important shift in cultural institutions now. Um, and that is that they're no longer being judged for how well they take care of their art. They're being judged by, for instance, labor practices, social justice issues, investment strategies. So this is a protest that's been projected on the Guggenheim about their labor practices and their multiple museums that they're building, right? And so it's not really curatorially how well they're taking care of their collection. It's about outward focusing how they treat people. So don't lose that, how they treat people. Cultural institutions and the expectations we have on them have really shifted. And then here's a friend of mine, Elon, Elon Cook, who travels the United States. She takes anarchist cards and also her own um, statements, and she'll stand in front of statues as a guerrilla tactical historian to tell the true, full story of that statue rather than what's up just on that statue. And then, of course, we know about Black Lives Matter, the tagging, the take them down NOLA. Um, we know that um, these statues are being uh, just pulled down on their own. Um, we know the story about Mississippi right now trying to get two flags passed, so one can have the Confederate flag and one does not. Um, these issues are really starting to um, infiltrate the, the museum cultural field as well. And, and we have these kind of very established organizations like the Brownies. Again, San Francisco. Why San Francisco? Um, these guys get little badges for working in a homeless shelter or picketing, doing social justice issues, delivering food. Um, that, that the Brownies and what they do has shifted with this group. It's no longer the traditional needlework badge. It's social justice. And quite frankly, guys, a lot of people don't need us. They got 200 bucks, they can get their DNA tested, they can track down their ancestry. It's one of the reasons why a lot of um, um, uh, geographical societies are, 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 or genealogical societies are taking their libraries and giving them to places, repositories, and putting everything online. Bricks and mortar is becoming a real kind of albatross around these organizations next, um, partially because so much can be done online. And here in your own city right here is Detroit, where the demolition of buildings is becoming contemporary art. The fact of making it something and then destroying it is in itself a kind of notation of history, of legacy. And then we've got Ai Weiwei here, who just takes a priceless vase and just drops it. Who cares about this stuff when human rights are in problem. And that's the real shift with cultural institutions. And this is where house museums have to speak to because it's happening all around us.
society shares a vision of a cultural shift from our current culture of death denial and body preservation to one of decomposed culture, a radical acceptance of death and decomposition. Accepting death means accepting that we are physical beings who are intimately connected to the environment, as the research on environmental toxins confirms. As the saying goes, we came from <coughs> dust and will return to dust. And once we understand that we're connected to the environment, we see that the survival of our species depends on the survival of the planet. I believe this is the beginning of true environmental responsibility. Thank you. And so this is something that's extremely important at a larger level, and that is that the notion of preservation is shifting. Even just in how we consider and take care of our own bodies at burial, the notion of green burials, the variation that now is happening in the West, and, and the sooner we understand that what we do is we take care of dead things that are useless, including our houses, the sooner we're going to understand this shift. And this woman's wearing a mushroom suit, which takes out the toxins in your body so that the soil can actually grow things. If you don't do that, our bodies have so much um, content in them that will actually kill plants. And so this is a really fascinating thing. There are fashion designers who are designing um, uh, things for you to wear that will decompose with your body. <clears throat> <coughs> And then we've got contemporary artists like um, Jorge, who is now the dean of Columbia University and Press, uh, uh, Columbia Press Preservation. Um, and so he does something called the ethics of dust, which is he actually takes latex and puts it on artifacts and pulls off the dust and grime. We used to throw it away. Now he puts it right next to the artifact itself making the point that there is as much history and legacy in the grunge as the artifact itself. So this is at the Victorian Albert. And just to let you know, this is one Saturday at my house um, with dust. And of course, I think all of you know about Rosa Parks' this house that was uh, picked up and moved from Detroit to Berlin. And then, of course, it's going to come back and it's going to start to become part of a contemporary art exhibit. And you, you, what you should see here is that, that preservation is starting to, um, starting to give way to contemporary art. Contemporary art has a far more creative understanding of how to use the legacies of artifacts than most preservationists and museum professionals. And this is Minokin in Warsaw, Virginia, which is instead of rebuilding this house, they're actually putting a glass cube as a part of it. And there's lots of examples of using um, glass um, as a part of a historic house museum. So um, this is a museum that is actually being built, I believe, right now in Birmingham, Alabama, which is the Museum of Lynchings and Mass Incarcerations. So you're also seeing this shift into social justice. And then what is a collection object? In this case, it's soil collected underneath where the person was lynched, most of them gathered by family members. So all of a sudden, the collection items are no longer fancy silver, or important George Washington Windsor chairs, it's something else, very different. City was silent again in 2004 to provide sanctuary to writers exiled under threat of persecution. Writers in exile have come from countries ranging from China, El Salvador, Burma, Venezuela, and we've had visiting writers now from 42 different countries. The first house that we developed was the house of Wang Shan, our poet from China, and he wrote an anthology of his poems on the face of the house. So this is in Pittsburgh, the city of asylum, in a historic district on historic buildings. But, but what's happening now is that one is starting to question, what is that period of significance? What's the period of importance? Where do you bring the site back to? Whose narrative is of value? How does one deal with multiple narratives? What is it, and we called it, the poetics of preservation? That's really a shift with house museums right now. 
We really have to get out of the concept of one single period of significance and bring everything, including the fake reproduction wallpaper and floor coverings, down to that period and understanding that lots of lives and lots of people touched that building. And then, of course, we've got a lot of things that started out as um, mobile pop-up museums and the mu uh, Museum of Broken Relationships is just one example. Um, so these are all crowdsourced collections objects. Just think back when I was talking about the Museum of Lynchings. Um, so this is a woman's wedding dress crammed into a mason jar. Um, this is a pair of men's underwear and its tag says, one size too small. Um, this is someone's receipt when a boyfriend brought her there and broke up with her at the Museum of Broken Relationships. So we get pretty meta, right? Um, but what's really valuable here is to understand that these types of places are becoming social constructs within the larger framework of society. What that means is when people are upset about their broken relationships, they're going to the Museum of Broken Relationships. They actually need consoling. When's the last time one of us really had somebody at our site because they needed to be there? At a museum or cultural site or a house museum. And then we've got this, believe it or not, which is in Beirut. It's a house museum. Instead of restoring it, this mansion um, called the Yellow House is now going to be open to the public. And then um, this museum just opened this year and won the Museum of the Year internationally, which is the World Childhood Museum. Again, crowdsourced collections, not beautiful objects, but they're objects that kids held on to through the war. This young man loved books, so he ran to the library when it was on fire, and he held on to it. So you can see this, this um, really kind of marginalization becoming mainstream with new museums. Thank you so much. You can certainly find me later too. Yeah. Frankly, we need to talk about your jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as I was saying, I do these things called one night stands where we'll sleep in house museums and the whole point is to show 
that they were one time actually used. And so we'll sleep on the real beds, use the real seats, make real tea out of the china, spend 24 hours there, and then I blog about it. And normally what I do is I blog about things that aren't part of the narrative. Everything I'm talking about here. So when we slept in the attic at Q Palace, it was really about um, the servants that lived up there. And then that led into the servants taking care of the Mad King. And so it's going to become part of a discussion of mental health, which is not something they talk about at Q Palace. And so I think Q Palace may be on here somewhere in the back. So that's what the jacket is. Yes? Mesda? Mesda, it's the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Art. And in fact, Mesda has been right on top of our changes that we've been making at Old Salem. We've started to introduce universal access for um, people on cognitive impairments. Um, we've started to do exhibits on the Hidden Town Project, which is a new project where we're locating all of the slave dwellings throughout the entire historic district, and we're going to be um, interpreting those. We're pulling out things from the collections that tell a story relative to the Hidden Town um, story. So all of that is happening at Mesd itself, as well as this summer, they have something called the Summer Institute, and it's going to be dedicated to the material culture of African Americans in the Low Country as it relates to the Hidden Town story. So they are dead smack in the middle of what we're doing. Yeah. And, and because of the time frame, I, I didn't have, but I had a whole slide on how contemporary artists are responding to the ISIS and their destruction, um, that they're producing these things in 3D printers, and they're putting chips inside of the little sculpture. Um, so when those get destroyed, you can always make another one. So it's kind of this acknowledgement that this shit's going to happen, and we have to figure out that the legacy is what's important, and not get so tied to the object itself. At least that's the kind of basis of it. Yes, hi. Ah, uh, no! <laughs> here, get up here! <laughs> I volunteered at the Historic Museum, and a lot of the board members and the current volunteers, bless their hearts, love to keep it pristine. They call it a little dollhouse. Are you from the South? No, I'm not. Because you said bless their hearts, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way of saying If one of the board members, for example, had some brilliant ideas from a brilliant Historic Museum anarchist book about how they could make this more interactive, for example, in messing up the room and making it like a person actually lived there, how would you get the board and maybe some of the volunteers who are a bit more traditional on board with this approach? Well, I'll say this. Absolutely, it's an issue. Um, the more, it, it's unfortunate, but the, the more that larger institutions like Montpelier and Old Salem and those do move in this direction, the more the smaller house museums and those boards who want to do the right thing. These are loving people dedicating volunteer hours to do this. Um, the more they will feel comfortable with change. But we were having a conversation that even at our board level, there's some discomfort with the changes. And we, you can talk about that as well. So, so it really does take a kind of leadership level of movement, although I tell people all the time, maybe you shouldn't record this, that being subversive sometimes can push the needle in the right direction. Little things, do figure out what you can do and then do that. But it's absolutely an issue. It's one that I've dealt with for 30 years. Yes, sir. An observation question. <coughs> all the examples deal with destruction and death, mm -hmm. which we all face ourselves because we will all die and we all have messy Thank you, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And in a sense, it seems to me what many of us do in historic preservation, I do with plant collections, is we try to deny disorder and deny, and deny death. That's exactly and right. I think part of what you, I'm just asking now is what you're thinking, <coughs> that this is part of why often they're not, we're not popular, is because we're unreal. I, I absolutely agree. I've got a talk that it's curating death, death and decay. Um, and it talks about um, how demolition, and that's where the, the funeral for a home comes from. Ultimately, here's this destruction of this physical artifact, and the woman crying actually was born in that home. So you can see that this legacy is alive whether or not that home is there. I absolutely believe that there is a shift in the way we view ourselves as artifacts and objects, 
and it's one of the reasons why we're having a hard time raising money with generations that are younger than me because they're not quite convinced that it really matters, right? And so, yeah, I agree with, completely with you, completely. Yes? Um, I just want to quickly chime in on that, though, because yeah, go I ahead. feel like we also live in a really aggressive capitalist system that where everything is expendable, right? Including history. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and so there is a part which is this sort of the flip side, right? The sort of charbonies of, of the skill of this sort of conversation about, yes, everything dies, but what is the importance of insisting that history matters, that there are things, I mean, people would be happy to completely forget the genocide of the indigenous people and and in fact, there are people trying to do that. Exactly. And so there is a way where I think not just wholeheartedly embracing the sense of like, oh, yes, we all die, so conservation doesn't matter. But how do we do it in a sort of 21st century way that is inspired by something meaningful rather than just, oh, shit, we have to save this stuff? Agreed. And, and we've got something right in front of us now. Please help me out. The person who's running for the Senate who, is, who denies the Holocaust happened? What state? Illinois. I mean, clearly, the, the, the preservation of those concentration camps and those photographs matter. They matter at a level that, that is unique. So I would completely agree with you. Um, so there really is this kind of difference, though, between that and the 15,000 plus house museums because grandma's house got donated to the city. You know, and the way that you experience those things and use those things. Yes. So here, sure. Um, would you comment very briefly on some of the work the Tournament Museum is doing? Because they have been doing this for a very long time and are very community focused. They sure are. And what's interesting, she asked about the Tenement Museum. What's interesting is I could be wrong, but the Tenement Museum starts in the early 80s. Most people in this room have baggage that goes back to the 30s. Right? Um, the Tenement Museum, and it's in New York City, could start fresh. And they, that's one of the reasons why they were able to get to where they are right now so quickly. Many of us, as this young lady was suggesting, are dealing with boards and kind of institutional inertia from 1932. So, that, so that, you know, I just re, um, reconfigured the Single Brothers House in Old Salem, and Johanna Brown told me it was the first time since 1962 that a piece of furniture was moved <laughs> in that building. Right? And so, so, so the issue for me is, um, that we can look to them in the directions that they moved, but we can't really look to them for how they made a shift because they didn't really make a shift. You can look to them that they have five specific um, tours and you go back and you buy tickets five times. There's lots to do. But I also have to tell you, when I'm in the middle of that tour and I'm not allowed to touch anything or sit on anything, it's not that different than going to Mount Vernon. So we have to, we have to understand that it, comprehensively, there's a difference between programming and environmental um, change. So it's a much larger conversation. Yeah. Well, I was just, you know, the common phrase, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. I think the point is you need to get people to associate with it so they can draw comparisons between history so they know history. Because certainly history is timely um, in terms of, yeah. you can draw lots of comparisons between history, contemporary politics, and society. And if yes, you don't agreed. Know history, and one of the workshops that we do with Twisted Preservation is we take the front page of the paper and give it to everybody in the room, the whole paper, rip it apart. And your job is to find out one story, yours would be easy, one story that would work with your narrative. Um, and in fact, we're doing that in one of our buildings at Old Salem. We're taking the front page of the Winston Salem Journal, and every day in the boys' school, because they read the newspaper every day. We, they're going to talk about the relationship. We're talking about immigration, refugees, naturalization. The whole story is right there. Almost every site can do that. Yes, ma'am. At our house, uh, I just I did exactly what you were saying. It broke down last month. I did that. You got fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you can, but it's not easy. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> oh, you pull it out once in a while, right? <laughs> I went in and I moved ropes and I brought down different furniture. 
furniture and yeah. I moved furniture, I moved pictures, and at the board meeting, oh, I am in some trouble. <laughs> 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 but I truly believe this stuff has got to be moved now. It's so bad. I want to spend the night in that upstairs bedroom. <laughs> And, 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 <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, yes, exactly. And just understand, that's just the very beginning. Just making a house immersive and furniture sittable and all that, that's like baseline today. You, I mean, I think all house museums need to have something of that. Like that, that can't be the end all be all. I mean, it might have been 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but no longer. You need to, it's, it's like that's the beginning and then start to deal with the narratives and then the interaction and the behaviors. Was there someone else? Yes, I'm sorry. Hi. Hi. First of all, this is very interesting. And the question I have is you mentioned something about managing 23 different museums. How does that work? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Man does Not work. easily, let me tell you. In New York City, there are 23 house museum sites throughout all five boroughs, and they're all in city parks. So I was the kind of nonprofit group that raised money and managed and ran all 23 of those sites, even though they were owned by the city. You'd think that was a good situation, but I could go into hours about how cities don't take care of their historic sites, and it actually became far more difficult to manage. So I was the central kind of hub for all of these individual sites that had their own friends groups. And so it was fairly, um, my partner John called me the, the kind of diplomat, the UN of historic preservation in New York City. So it wasn't easy. Yes, ma'am. Just tell me when you want to stop, okay? Okay. You talk about Jeff and, and of, of a house. You make me sound so maudlin. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, we have five people that died in the house that we are preserving. We have a haunted mansion at the uh, in October that is not a scary thing, it is a history thing. And we discussed the five people who have died in the house. The question is, what is a better way to treat that other than just having people represent those people? Well, understand that when we talk when I when I talk about death and decay, I'm talking at a conceptual level. I'm okay. talking I'm surely there are people who died in our houses and things, but I'm talking more about a kind of um, death and decay of a kind of social social construct, a kind of ebb and flow. You know, many of our houses were empty, then they became boarding houses, and then there were squats, and I think one of our next one night stands is gonna be in a squat in London. Um, maybe the sex pistols were there or something, I don't know. So, so for me, when I talk about death, it's like telling the narrative story. You know, and I, and I, and I think, you know, one of the things that I show is the housing um, complex in St. Louis that was imploded. Yes, um, that is a story about life and death. Um, and that documentary is just excellent about it. So, so um, I'm not saying go and tell the stories of all the people who died in your house, although I think that might be something of some interest. Um, and then the Halloween story and paranormal, that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> although I'm not someone who shies away from that, it's just another discussion. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, tell us which one. Meadowbrook Hall. Okay. Um, so it's 88,000 square foot. Um, I know it, yes. <laughs> so we have a very, what my big aim has been taking it back to the original because it's either safety or convenience, or it's a joke, things are put in storage, or things are tucked away, and it's not what it used to look like. So that's been my big thing. Um, this Christmas, we had someone at an event um, fall into our grandfather clock. Mm -hmm. So I looked at having it fixed, and I kind of decided not to because ethically we should raise every dollar we spend, and I was like, I can't spend that kind of money on this when you know it, it should go somewhere else. So I have a couple questions. One, apparently at this event the woman did it like didn't really care. No one took number or an apology, but people had it or. Um, there's no concern really about it at all, so I'm wondering how do I make people both enjoy the house but also care if they're, because we've had things, you know, pur uh, purposely destroyed and they'll mm -hmm. be like, what? <laughs> so, um, so I'm trying to figure out how to do that besides all the other typical ways, how do I make people care? And then also, 
I guess, what to do with that block. I was kind of thinking about turning it in, so I turn it into this kind of art piece and talk about the broken part of it um, and have it kind of a deconstructed. Um, but because we have a wedding and it's on the staircase and that's where I'm going to get the yeah. photos taken. So I'll answer, I'll answer this in a kind of higher level. Um, the only damage I've ever had in my 30 years of working in house museums has been from weddings. Never contemporary art exhibit with hipsters with skateboards and knapsacks and those are the ones that got all the attention and nobody cared about weddings because they brought in cash. Um, that is an issue in house museums. I don't know if you rent out. You don't. You don't have to. You've got less money. <laughs> um, I want to talk about your other issue at a higher level, and that is um, how do you make people care? Um, I would say that if you are so contained and isolated in the way that you engage your community, you haven't allowed people to care about your site. Let me say that again. If all you're doing is caring for your objects and you've got a sign with a bunch of no's right at the entranceway, why the hell should I care about your site? I'm not speaking specifically about yours. I'm talking at a higher level. Why should I care about your site? You don't care about me, my experience, the stories that you're going to tell me. I get no sense of welcome. Now, I'm, I'm presenting this in an extreme case, right, that I don't feel welcomed. In most cases, you don't feel welcomed when you go to a historic site because of all the no's. Um, do you allow photography? No. no. <laughs> I'll just stop right there. So that's my, it's a much larger conversation. Thank you.